Thank you, Shannon and Mike. That was awesome. Could I invite you? Let's just please stand together. Let's just pray before we open up God's word. Our God and our Father, thinking of the song that was just sang, sung here, Father, we just really appreciate the fact that you did build a bridge, that you bridged this gap that we could not bridge ourselves, Lord. Though many try, throughout the history of man, we've come up with all kinds of means and solutions and attempts to try to somehow traverse this, this huge cavern that is between you and us, Father. And the great deception of this world is that from, from Satan and from the world itself and from our own self-righteousness is that many think that they're doing it. Many think that just with a little bit more personal effort, with a little more sweat on their religious brow, somehow they can, they can make this work between them and you, realizing, Father, that the entirety of all that must happen is work that you have done already on the cross. And we thank you for that, God. So whatever it is this morning, God, that may be holding us back, whatever it is this morning that may be preventing us from seeing Jesus for all that he is, for eternal life, for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, or maybe for those believers here this morning, they're, they're, they're assured of their salvation, but something is still holding them back in giving their life fully to you. I just pray that right now, as we stand before you, that we would lay this at your feet, God that we would be willing to say to you, God, whatever it is you wish to do with my life, I want to do it. So God, I ask that with all the struggles, with all the shortcomings, with all the limitations we have, cause us, Father, to just grow in power and strength and confidence in you and in your word. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. What do you do when a severely sick follower of Jesus Christ is hurting. And I'm not talking specifically about hurting physically, though that can be a symptom. But they're in pain. They're in pain. They're hurting morally, spiritually. They know that they are in pain. They admit it, which is a good thing. But they refuse any help to correct it. And that's not a good thing. The difficult road to recovery is before them. And they realize it may mean giving up some unhealthy dependency. It may mean committing to an exercise of some kind of wholesomeness that will be hard on them for a while. But recovery from whatever that wound is they have in their life, recovery from that sin that they have been losing ground to, is absolutely possible in their lives. They can make this work. But for any number of reasons, they refuse the road to a healthier moral, spiritual, and mature life. Now, this is a condition of rebellion against the moral perfection of, of God, and it's something that we cannot gain. We cannot win this battle if it's rejected. That is, when the character of Christ, which is to be molded in our lives, is somehow, and for whatever reason, pushed aside by those strong urges of the flesh that we have. Now, with the believer in Christ, they're in a little bit different standing. With the believer in Christ, there actually is no excuse of being able to say, well, you know, I'm just too weak to this sin. We don't have that as an excuse. We don't have the excuse of being able to say, well, you know what, I'm just in the wrong environment. You just don't understand what I have to get up to every morning on, on Monday and start my week. You don't know the places that I have to be and have to move through. Now, in the flesh alone... All of that could be true in other things. But as a Christian, I'm talking about a Christian in the way that the Bible defines what it means to be a Christian. We don't deny, we certainly do not deny sin's power. We don't deny its persuasion. It is certainly there and it is powerful. But we have to grasp the idea that as a Christian, we have been crucified with Christ. Sin in your life was killed on the cross. Now, sin's influence still persists in this life, but no longer its dominance. It no longer dictates its demands to me like it did before I was a believer in Christ. Earlier in ministry, 
there was an important but frustrating truth that I learned. I have learned a lot of important and frustrating truths in life. And I don't think I've learned them just because I was in ministry. I happened to be in ministry, and these were just life principles, life truths that I began to learn. But this is a truth that I've, that I've never liked. I, I never liked it because I've, I've seen it unwind in a multitude of ways, and it always leads to, to disaster if it is not corrected. And the truth is simply this. Not everyone who seeks healing really wants to be healed. You already know that, don't you? I didn't come up with any grandiose thought here, right? I'm not a philosopher. That's actually called a conundrum. A conundrum is kind of like a catch-22 situation. It's, it's kind of like that idea when you're applying for a job and you've got, you know, you're, you're schooled in this job and, and you really have the desire for this job and you sit down in that position and the, and, the, and the employer is looking at your resume and says, man, I really like what I see here, but there's one problem. You don't have any experience. Well, what do you say? Well, how do I get experience until somebody hires me so that I can get it? And they go, well, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do about that. That's a conundrum. Because I always thought when I apply it to the situation that, that not everyone who seeks healing really wants to be healed, I always thought that people who sought healing really wanted healing, including myself. If you want to open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 5, John chapter 5, now we're going to be putting these passages up on the screen a little bit later as well, but we find in John chapter 5 that Jesus approaches a man. Now, just making that statement right there is something we should begin to be seeing, probably already know, in the life of Jesus. Jesus has a habit of doing this. He has a habit of approaching people. But in this case, he approaches a man who was very sick of body. This guy's been sick for 38 years, and he has been seeking to be made well. Now, we don't know what the infirmity is. We don't even really know how old he is. He's been sick 38 years. It doesn't mean he's 38 years old. I get the impression from the story that he's older than that. But this is a guy who is seeking to be made well, even if it means that he has to test some kind of miracle cure. And if you remember, several weeks before Easter, we were looking at some of those heretics that are out there, guys like Peter Popoff, who offer these miracle healing oils and miracle waters and things like this. This is a guy who was ready for that kind of stuff. And once again, as we see Jesus do time and again, he's going to use the immediate surrounding events to strike up a conversation. Hey, buddy, I can see that you're really sick. Do you want to be made well? Well, as we try to unwrap this story in the first 18 verses of John 5 here this morning, we're going, to, we're going to look at four different parts to the story of this man's sincere desire to be healed. This was a guy who has spent the larger part of his life fighting to get well. And we're going to see why Jesus does this. Now, he's going to do what he'll do for this guy, yes, because we know that he loves this man in the same way that Jesus loves everyone. But we also know that Jesus doesn't heal everyone, right? I mean, if you think about Jesus' ministry, for all of the healing that he did with people, and, and it's far more than just what the scriptures will reveal to us, but, but for all the healings that he did, it was still just a small percentage of all of those who would have been sick in Jerusalem and in the surrounding area during his time. Because when he does heal, he has a greater purpose in mind than just mending a broken physical body he will reveal a terrible contrast. There's going to be a contrast here between those who hurt and they want help desperately and those who hurt and refuse to accept the diagnosis that they are sick and need help desperately. We're going to see, there are four parts of the stories, we're going to see Jesus' genuine concern for the man. That'll be the first thing. He really is concerned about the, the place this guy is in in life. And then, of course, like with most of his miracles, it's going to bring about some controversy. And then from that, we're going to see a stark contrast in how callous the religious elites are towards this man. So he's going to have a great concern. There'll be controversy. There'll be callousness from the Jews. And then lastly, Jesus will make some bold claims about himself. Well, let's begin first, and we'll put this up on the screen, on how this whole scene unfolds. We're going to look first at the concern for the man. We pick it up in John chapter 5 in the first seven verses. It says, Now after these things, there was a feast of the Jews. Now we don't know what this feast is. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
And there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. They were waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Now, if you'll notice, from the middle of verse 3 down through the end of verse 4, there's brackets around that, typically in most translations. And we'll get back to that in a moment and explain why that's there. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. So when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered and said to him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. So we see clearly there's a guy here who has a problem and he knows it. He's desperate to do anything to make this right. Now, it was a common practice of the day to seek healing in this particular pool in Bethesda in Jerusalem. And we want to note here now that this man, his age, his affirmity, all those kind of things is not revealed to us, but we know that whatever it is, it seems to have left him completely and totally physically incapacitated. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the middle of verse 3 down through verse 4, that whole situation there of the, of the angel coming down and stirring up the water. It has a bracket around it because that is basically an editor's note. It's not there in the original. And the reason why it's not there in the original is because that's meant to tell us that this is a disputed part of the text. Those scholars who, who go about reproducing the manuscripts, because as you realize, we don't have any of the originals of the Bible. There's no, no, no writings out there that we've discovered so far that have been signed by Moses or signed by Paul or signed by John. What we have are copies called manuscripts. Now, that's not unusual. Most writings of antiquity are like that. The writings of Roman historian Tacitus, the writings of Julius Caesar, we don't have their originals. We have manuscripts, copies. And nobody argues the fact that when you go through these manuscripts, that's how you reproduce the originals here. Now, that's another topic for another story. But that's all it's saying here, is that apparently that this story of the angel coming down appears in some later manuscripts, but not in earlier ones. So it's just questioned whether John actually penned that particular story when he wrote this down. It seems that later tradition held that that's exactly what happened. An angel would come down periodically, would stir up the waters to provide some kind of a healing component in the water, but whether or not John actually wrote that, we don't know. But it doesn't affect the story one bit. Because the rest of the story, which is not in dispute by anybody, clearly tells us that people believed that. They believed that something in the water would get stirred up and it would have some kind of healing component when it got stirred up. And in a moment, we'll look at this passage, but I'm just going to mention it now. When we get to verse 14, we do find that in this guy's case, this this. this um, paralyzed guy's case here, with his disability, Jesus so reveals to us that it does seem to have some kind of healing effect. Because he wants somebody to, to put him into the water, but every time he gets stirred up, he can't do it. And we'll get back to that in a few moments because it's going to lend itself to an even greater emphasis to the story here. And Jesus will also reveal to the guy, it seems like he's done something personally to add to his calamity. And that becomes important as well. Because when you go back to verse 6, when Jesus asks him the question, do you want to get well? His real purpose is to move beyond this guy's physical need, which is deep. And it is irreparable by any human standards. But he wants to move beyond that to his deep spiritual need, which is even more severe and even more irreparable and deadly. And so the obvious answer from anybody who has desperately sought miraculous healing for as long as he has, is yes. Yeah, I want to be healed. Any way that it can be done, I will take it. And it starts to become obvious to those in desperate need that there is a truth, there's a principle that comes out in all of us. And the principle is this, that desperation is a blessing of eternal value when it leads the desperate to Christ. Desperation is a blessing of eternal value when it leads 
the desperate to Christ. And for those of us who begin to understand that, learning to discern that in your own life, or learning to discern that in the life that, that maybe God has called you, allowed you to connect with, a, with another person who is, who is desperate as well, it's, it would be important for us to learn, is God using this desperation to reach this person? And if you can discern that in some way, what that does for you is it helps you to balance the presentation of the gospel with your compassion. We need to be compassionate, of course, but we can allow our compassion to get away with the deeper need of something else in a person's life. If they're hurting really bad, we may not want to also express to them, yeah, you know you're also lost in sin. And our compassion sometimes can kind of get in the way with all of this. Let me give you an example. About three years ago, I was sitting in a doctor's office, and my wife was there. She just had to meet with a doctor to talk about some of her medicine, so it wasn't something I needed to go into the office with. So I sat in the outer office, and as I'm sitting there, a young guy, looked like he's about 35, comes in, and he's pushing an older man in a wheelchair. And this man in the wheelchair has no legs. He is cut off at the stump. And so they're sitting about a seat away, and you know, you kind of look up and you make eye contact. Hi, how you doing? Boy, nice day out there, that kind of stuff. Well, finally, this guy in the wheelchair, he gets called into his office with his doctor. So I just strike, a, strike up a conversation with this younger guy. And I said, hey, if you don't mind my asking, I said, boy, I feel really bad about that. Is that your dad? No, he said, it's my uncle. And I said, again, you know, you don't have to answer this, but I'm just curious. I go, what happened to him? I'm thinking in my mind, oh, man, a tragic car accident. Maybe he's a veteran, got, you know, wounded in the war, something like this. He says, well, he says, my uncle has a problem. He has diabetes, but he doesn't care. And he hasn't cared for a long time. He drinks, he smokes, he takes illegal drugs. And I keep telling my uncle, if you don't stop this, there's going to be nothing left to your body. He said, every time I push you in here, they're going to take more of your body from you. It started out with him taking his toes, then his feet, then his legs up to his ankle, now up to his stump. And he said, I told my uncle, how desperate is it going to come for you until you finally stop and realize that you are sick? That's what's happening here. So what we find is that Jesus has great concern for this man as a man. He has great concern for him as a human being because that's the way he is. Jesus has great concern for us, great concern for how we hurt, why we hurt. But of course, we also know he won't always heal us in the way that we would like it to be done, right? There has to be a purpose greater than just the healing itself, and that purpose greater than the healing of my body itself is always, always his glory. Because it's only by embracing his glory am I truly healed. But as with most of Jesus' healings and miracles, this does not go unnoticed by his enemies who want to use this compassionate and caring moment here as a way to harm him. And that takes us to the controversy of the healing. What you have here are those rascally Jewish leaders. And they look at this as a violation of tradition, completely ignoring the humanity in all of this. Let's pick it up at verse 8. Now, now Jesus has just asked this guy, in verse 6 and 7, he's just asked this guy, do you want to get well? And this guy, of course, says, yeah, for 38 years I've been trying to get into this. You know, and, but there's nobody there. And, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase verse 8. So after this long explanation, Jesus kind of stops this guy and just says, okay, wait a minute, i got a better solution. Why don't you just stand up? Verse 8. Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately, the man became well. Immediately, he picks up his pallet and begins to walk. Now, right there, you would think this story would have all kinds of celebration. People running up to this guy going, man, I can't believe it. I know you've been here for decades and you're now walking, you're now carrying a pallet. That is awesome. That would be great, except for the last part of verse 9. Now, it was the Sabbath on that day. This is not a good thing. We, we find out why, verse 10. Because the Jews were saying to this man who was cured, it is a Sabbath. It's not permissible for you to be carrying your pallet. So Jesus tells the lame man how to get well. 
After 38 years of apparent physical incapacity, this guy can't even get himself into the pool by himself. Jesus simply tells him, why don't you just stand up? You know what that is? That is a conscious, immediate, and dependent act of the will based solely on the power and provision of another. In this case, it's Jesus. And that is exactly what needs to take place when a person is born again. When sins are forgiven and eternal life is gained. And I don't think that this man here, I mean, after all of his desperation, I don't think this guy, and apparently he doesn't have any reservation to accept Jesus' offer because his desperation has an eternal value and it drove him to this. And we're told in verse 9, that's exactly what he does. Look at that word there, immediately. That's a word you should underline. Put a circle around that. Take your red or your, your yellow marker out and mark that. Immediately. Immediately. That is the best approach to God's offer to us for anything. His best approach, or our best approach, when he offers us healing, or he offers us eternal life, or anything else in life, immediately respond. And we find immediately he became well. Immediately he picks up his palate. He displays his physical healing before everyone. I mean, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? I mean, this guy had a long history of willingness. And so when this healing presents itself, he doesn't flinch. What's also interesting here is in verse 13, he doesn't even know who Jesus is yet. And he doesn't care. He just wants what Jesus offers. It meets his, his deepest physical need. But not everyone is ready for healing. Not everyone wants what Jesus has to offer them. He does this great compassionate and loving miracle, but unfortunately, oh man, he does it on the wrong day. Can you imagine that? I mean, I wouldn't think that there is a wrong day for doing something like this to another human being, but oh, apparently there is, if you are a religionist. In fact, that's the theme of our next several messages after today. This is just kind of an introduction to this. We're going to be looking at the religionists for the next several weeks, what it means to be a religionist. How is it that we can connect with the religionist, with the gospel of Jesus Christ? But if you are a religionist, if you're a religious person, you're self-absorbed and you're self-righteous, we're told in verse 9 that they come to Jesus, or they come to this man and they say, hey, it was the Sabbath. You did this on the Sabbath. Oh boy, now he's in big trouble. I mean, just think about it. Couldn't Jesus just have waited one more day? I mean, what's one more day to a guy who's been sick for 38 years of suffering like this? I would think if I was suffering for 38 years and I could be healed today and someone told me to wait till tomorrow, it would feel like another 38 years, wouldn't it? Why do I have to wait? So it's the Sabbath. And this is where the third part of our story, the callousness of the Jews, is seen. Pick it up again in verse 10 down through verse 16. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it's the Sabbath. What are you doing? It's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, well, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? Notice how often they keep repeating the miracle here. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple. He says to him, behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. So the man went away. And he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Now, they're persecuting him here, but in a few moments, it's going to get worse than that. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Now, why? What's the reason? The reason is not because he healed, but because he did something on the Sabbath. So for that reason, they're persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Now, the term the Jews here is typically a reference to the religionist. In this case, it's a reference to the religious establishment. They don't like this. And of course, when you are not ready for what Jesus is offering, you're going to come up with something more important of value. Hey, buddy, you can't be carrying that pallet on the Sabbath 
Now, just to kind of give you an idea of what's happening here, the pallet is what we would probably consider something like a sleeping bag today. It was simply nothing more than a bed of straw that was roped together and easily rolled up. Now, I want to put a picture up on the screen here to show you what these Jewish leaders were not seeing. This is not what they're looking at here. So you can't get this picture in your mind here. It's not like it's a guy walking down the street with a mattress or a hide bed slung over his shoulder. It's not like they're asking him, hey, buddy, you're carrying your pallet on the Sabbath, right? Yeah, I am. Wow, that's exciting. Aren't you the guy that was sick for 38 years and couldn't move? Yeah, that's me. Oh my gosh, that's absolutely awesome. I mean, I mean, how? When? Who? You would think that's the kind of stuff they would be asking here, but the callous religionists, they've got their own formulas as to how God works. And you, buddy, you have violated rule number 39. Now, just again, so we're clear about this, the law of Moses didn't forbid a man being healed or saved in any kind of way on the Sabbath. But these things here that they're talking about were of greater value than the strict adherence, even of the law of Moses. And to maintain a strict structure of all of this, the Pharisees added 39 more laws just to the Sabbath commandment alone. 39 more. This is of their own making. They do this because they want to make sure that the supernatural life wasn't just breaking out in in different places, unconfined and unregulated. And it actually was the 39th of these that restricted the carrying of a load from one, one location to another. You see, for them, that fourth commandment, of doing work on the Sabbath or doing no work on the Sabbath was far too speculative for them. It was far too free. So what they did is they came up with these 39 restrictions, which they defined what work could and could not be done on the Sabbath. Because after all, God didn't seem to want to do that for them. And sure enough, carrying a load on the Sabbath was what he violated. What is the divine contrast here? The contrast is this, the open willingness of a non-religious man to embrace the unconstrained power and compassion of God to be healed with that of the closed callousness of the religionists who can't see this. They cannot embrace God who is so free and so powerful to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. They're not looking to get well. And you know why? Because they still don't believe they're sick. For them, this man's long-term lameness was better than violating all of the healthy religious rules you could possibly come up with. Sometimes in our contact with people, we'll find those people who are spiritually lame. They're spiritually sick. And these are the people, for the most part, who are already prepared for this message of hope that you have. They are ready for healing. Yeah, I, do whatever you want. Just put me into the pool. Just tell me about Jesus. I am so ready for him. And when you have that experience, that is absolutely awesome. But other times, other times we are left with the healthy who don't know that they are sick. And folks, you can be in a wheelchair your body cut off to the stump of your body and still not know that you're sick. They don't want to know. And it's very, very difficult and it's painful to try and show them that they are. And when you try to show them that they are, they're not necessarily going to like you for it because not everyone wants to be healed. Self-help and self-righteousness does not ask the question, am I sick? It just judges whether everyone else is. These Jewish leaders, they don't even ask one single encouraging follow-up question to this man's miraculous healing. Accusations, incriminations, violations, that's all they have on their mind. For them, remaining paralyzed and not carrying your straw sleeping bag on the Sabbath is better than its opposite. How callous. How uncompassionate. How cold. And this is why redemption 
True redemption can only happen in freedom because it brings freedom from all of the constraints of sin. When I am walled up, when I'm inside and I'm all walled up with my hardened categories, you know what happens is I can't see what's happening out there. I think, every, I think the whole world revolves right around here, this, this wall that I've got built up. I can't see beyond my, my own walls. And for the sake of those who are trapped inside of those walls, we have to try and find a way to scale them. We have to find a way somehow to bring those walls down, to punch a hole in through it in some way. We do it in love. We do it in compassion for them. But it's going to look like it's an invasion to them. Notice what happens to the lame man here. In verse 11, this guy is left on his own uh, to defend all of this. Hey, I don't know who it was. The guy who healed me told me that I could pick up my bed and walk with it. And, 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 and I'm telling you what, if somebody comes to a guy like this after 38 years and tells you, hey, just stand up and walk, you better believe I'm going to do it. And if I'm standing up walking and he tells me to pick up my pallet, you better believe I'm going to do it. You know what that is? The wall has been scaled. That's freedom. And then in verse 13 again, he says, I don't know who this guy was. When you are confined to a broken body for that long, I would bet that you would take every opportunity given for freedom of movement. If, if you know that you are broken. And you can be in a wheelchair with your legs cut off at your stump and not know that you're broken. The religious leaders don't know this. Not even when it's right there, staring them in the face. They follow the path of, of least resistance, which will not lead them to mercy or grace or freedom. For the self-righteous, that's too scary. That's unchartered territory. Just give me another rule to follow. 39 prohibitions, not enough to get me through the Sabbath. Hey, we can always add a few more. And self-righteousness doesn't allow for, the, for this kind of compassion that this man received from Jesus because it's, it just comes outside of the rules of righteousness. The hope of Jesus can come in any moment. It can come to me when I'm in the worst place in life. It will come to me when I'm in, I'm in the best place in life. This mercy will come upon me. It's no respecter of my station in life. It isn't going to care what my pedigree is. It's not going to care how smart I am. It's not going to care what my culture or my age or anything else is. It will not be concerned about my standards of righteousness because our standards of righteousness are always bad outside of Jesus. And this is what Jesus has had to teach before. He, remember Nicodemus? Now Nicodemus happened to be a Pharisee who really was sincerely trying to figure out the mercy of God. And so he comes to Jesus that night. So what? What are you telling me, Jesus? I, there's no rules that I have to follow when it comes to this whole idea of really being connected with God, being saved? What's that term again? Born again? What is it? No standards I have to follow? No. No rules. No standards. And the thing is, is Jesus tells Nicodemus, and you should know all about this, right? You're a Pharisee. You know the law. You're the first person who should know that by trying to keep the law, you continually prove you can't keep the law. That's what it exists for. The law exists to keep pointing out to us that we are sinners. Here's the perfection of God, all these rules, the law of Moses. Here's you. You can't keep them. Well, if this is the perfection of God, all these rules, and I can't keep them, I'm in big trouble, right? Yes. Yes. That's the best place for you to be. In the middle going, that I'm completely lost. Yes, you are. Stop trying. Because I've got the answer for you. It continues to show you how sick you really are and in desperate need. In fact, in chapter 3, in John chapter 3, Jesus refers to this whole situation as something like the wind. Here's what he says. i got this uh, passage up on the screen here. He says, don't marvel that I told you you must be born again. Now, look how he explains this. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Right here with this lame man, the Spirit has been blowing. 
This, this, the, you know, they, they heard the sound of this all blowing. They, they felt it blowing over their faces here. But instead of embracing it, they retreated back into their, into their solid fortress of self-righteous minutia and the non-essentials of life. This is why it is hard for the religionist to see Jesus for all that he is. And understand, it's not that they don't necessarily appreciate Jesus, because they do. And don't think for a moment they don't try to live for Jesus because they do. And they will even attempt to worship him. But wait, to release my soul, my eternal destiny to him alone plus nothing? Simply not in their categories. So there's a tendency to be cold and callous to those who do. To those who say, hey, just let the wind of the Spirit blow. Let Jesus do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Save you. Heal your sickness of sin. Heal your broken body of desperation. So the concern of the man is he wants to be healed. The controversy is that when healing comes, it violates some self-righteous category, that is the Sabbath. Then we see the callousness of the Jews was that the legal was more important than the lame. Then lastly, we have the claim of Messiah. Because Jesus' response to all this is just what really sets them off. Verse 17 and 18. So he answers them and he says, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Now that's somewhat kind of cryptic to us, but it's not to the Jews. Verse 18. For this reason, because of what Jesus just said, they get the crypticness here. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but now he's calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. They're really mad at Jesus for the compassion he showed on the Sabbath to a really sick guy. And we saw in verse 16 they persecute him. And that's kind of a mild form of the word. It just means more of the idea that they probably just threw some insults, kind of like the face-to-face, nose-to-nose kind of thing. Spitting was kind of something you did in that day if you didn't like what somebody was saying, maybe that was going on. A little bit of pushing and shoving. But his next move here is volcanic. He equates all of this to his divine nature. In effect, what he says is because God continues to work even on the Sabbath. Why? Why can God work? Because God is the Lord of the Sabbath. No Jew would argue this point. And so knowing this, Jesus claims his divine right to do the same thing saying, in effect, because I'm God, I can lawfully and righteously heal on the Sabbath. And I can allow someone to work on the Sabbath as well. And notice John's comment here in verse 18. The Jews know exactly what he's implying because no Jew, first off, would ever claim to be God unless they were a heretic or they were insane. And by the way, these are two things that they will accuse Jesus of in the course of his ministry. And so John records now that they were seeking all the more to kill him for what they perceived as a heretical claim, that he is making himself equal with God. And being equal with God here always means to to, to be the thing that you claim to be. It's not separate but equal. They realize Jesus isn't just saying, I'm just another God equal with God. That's not what he's saying, and they know that. Because that's not what Jews believe. In fact, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, actually, we do have all one thing in common. We're all monotheistic. We believe in one God, one creator. Not many, not a polytheism here. This is why Messiah, when it comes to Judaism and Christianity, why Messiah could be accepted as a part of the triune nature of God. Now, that's where we part ways with Islam, because they don't see Jesus like that. They don't have a Messiah, per se. But when it comes to Judaism and Christianity, we can look at Messiah and say, yeah, He's a part of the triune nature of God. But when it comes to Judaism, they just hated the fact that Jesus claimed this for himself. So the whole point of the healing and of the controversy is to show that God is at work in Jesus, bringing people to a place of freedom and real rest in life. Freedom from the the debilitating effects of sin of the soul. I mean, we are all paralyzed by sin, all of us, until Jesus, through faith, sets us free. 
And when he sets us free, we now have rest of the soul in our search for, for meaning in life. Because we've got no meaning in life outside of Jesus. We fill it in with a lot of other things that we think are meaning in life. But at some point we realize we don't. Not until Jesus, through faith, unlocks the mystery of our life, which is eternal and not earthly. Well, this is the Jesus that we want people to see and to know. But they won't gain that until they know that they are truly sick and in need of healing. And revealing that to them can certainly be risky, as it was here. The obvious contrast here, the 38-year-old, long, paralyzed guy. Hey, I don't need convincing I already know that I'm sick. Just tell me what I have to do to get well. And that is contrasted with the healthy who will fight you tooth and nail to deny it. And we will connect with each in the course of our life. You probably came down on one side or the other or or leaned towards one part or the other. But when we connect with each of them, we respond to each of them with exactly the same message. Jesus will set you free. Let's stand and let's close in prayer. Our Father and our God, we do again thank you for this freedom that you offer, the bridge that you built, the bridge of the cross, Father, that we know is the the narrow way, God, because it's the only way. We don't need multiple ways confusing us because that's what the world does. The world confuses us with religion and self-righteousness and self-help, God. But you've condensed it all down. You said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And God, we thank you for the clarity and the conciseness of the path you have set for us as a sinful and hurting humanity. So God, we thank you for these stories here that help to reveal to us, God, that we have to recognize that we are truly sick in need of healing, Lord. Thank you for the moving of your spirit in our lives. For those of us here this morning who are believers in Christ, Father, thank you for the moving of that spirit that we embraced, God, that we looked at and said, yes, this is what I need. I know that my only path to heaven is to be born again, and we, and we receive that into our lives. We also know, Father, there may be some here this morning, maybe those that we connect with throughout the week who don't know that. And I would ask that you would help us, Father, to be able to discern where these people are at and how we can best be able to touch them with this gospel that will set them free. But in many cases, God, they first have to know that they are really sick. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you that we don't do this in our own power. We thank you that we do this only by your grace and only by your mercy. It's that we can.